Good morning. Thank you for your very warm welcome and also thank you to the team of young volunteers who make this whole event possible because they're working hard in the background in a way you can't see. Yeah, quite. Come on. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here to have the opportunity to, to describe to you the Dolly experiment, why we did it, how we did it, what it achieved, and most particularly to discuss the way in which it's had totally new opportunities for studying a particular type of human disease, which will probably revolutionize the treatments that are available to many of us as we get older. So this is a very complicated project. It involves a very large number of people. So the first thing I want to do is to introduce them to you. And this is just the group that worked in my lab, but there are another five or six people who looked after the animals and another five or six people in a different lab who did some of the tests after she was born and who grew the cells, including the, the ones that we use for the actual cloning experiment. In this team here, the uh, back right-hand side is Keith Campbell, who devised the pro protocol that we used in this project with some very innovative suggestions. The back left is Bill Ritchie, who did all of the micro-manipulation. If I tell you that mammalian eggs are a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, that's a two hundredth of an inch in diameter, you'll realize that it's a very specialized, very skilled job. I'll show you what he could see down the microscope in a minute, but just to give you a little bit more background. He was working at a very sophisticated microscope with a joystick very similar to those that you'd use on a computer game on either side. And also on either side there was a syringe because he has to move the eggs and he has to, as you'll see, remove some of the cytoplasm from the eggs. So he has four things that he has to control. So technically very, very demanding. It demands very precise movements and tight concentration for several hours of the day. Well, let me show you what it looks like. That little gap at the beginning makes you test your nerves as to whether it's actually going to move. So you can see here sheep eggs, a large pipette on the left hand side, which is going to be used to pick up the eggs and a smaller sharp tipped pipette on the right hand side which is going to make the holes in the outer shells, which you can see, translucent outer shells, and is going to be used to remove the genetic information. So he's picked up one of the eggs, going to look at it under higher magnification. Now one of the problems is you can't see the chromosomes. But in a minute you'll see a small sphere of cytoplasm at six o'clock. We have every reason to think that the chromosomes are very close to it. And so he's going to remove it and some of the nearby uh, cytoplasm. In order to know whether or not he's successfully removed the chromosomes, this egg has been incubated in a dye which binds to DNA and fluoresces in UV light. So he takes the egg out of the field of view, turns on the light, and there are two fluorescent bodies. One is the chromosomes that were in that little sphere of cytoplasm, and the other is the chromosomes that were in the egg. So this time he's been successful. If he didn't see two groups, then he'd either have to discard the egg or try again. So he then has to provide the new genetic information which is going to control development. In the case of Dolly, these cells were grown from mammary gland of a ewe that was about two-thirds of the way through pregnancy. He's picking up several of these uh, cells. And this, since this is the same pipette, you can see that these are very much smaller than the egg. And what he's going to do is to go back to, to an egg from which the genetic information has been removed and he's going to put that cell in the space between that outer shell and the big cell in the middle. And we're then going to use an electric current to do two things, to fuse the two cells together and to stimulate the egg to begin development. The electric current will only work if the two cells are touching, so the last thing he'll do is just to push them together. We'll just watch him do that one more time. During a fairly intense day's work, he would be able to attempt the process with something like 100, 150 eggs. There would be a technical problem or a biological problem with about half of them. So a really good uh, day's work would be to have 
60, 70 eggs, uh, new embryos made in that way. So then what we do is to put those embryos into foster mothers, surrogate mothers, which will give the embryo the chance to develop to term. And sometimes we would have a lamb which would have the opportunity to grow up into a healthy adult. You may remember that Dolly was just one lamb from more than 270 attempts. The efficiency has increased just a little bit since then, but it's still of the order of 2 or 3% uh, with, a, with an adult cell in, in sheep. So this was a very exciting, very important experiment for several reasons. First of all, it did give us and other groups around the world the opportunity to make precise genetic changes in the cells which were carrying the genetic information so that they could carry in the genes that encode human immunoglobulins, for example. Or we could change the animal not by adding a gene, but by turning off something which was, was disadvantageous to the animal a complete opportunity to change the animals either for its own benefit, its health, or to provide something to treat human disease. That was our initial objective. But the most, by far the most important thing was that it made biologists think differently. What we had done was to take a cell from an adult animal and put it into the egg and we got a, a new animal. So what this showed was, first of all, that that cell had got all of the genetic information that was necessary for normal development, but also that the functioning of that genetic information could be reset, or the jargon we would use is reprogram, back from an adult cell function to the function of a very early embryo. What it made lots of people think was, well, if the unknown factors in the egg can reprogram a cell in that way, are there other ways which can achieve the same benefit? And people began to think of the proteins, special proteins called transcription factors, which are very important in controlling the functioning of cells. This simple scheme shows what you can see inside a cell. It shows at the bottom a helix of DNA, which is unwound slightly, and binding to it are transcription factors, which move along the DNA instructing the production of the particular product which is shown just above the double helix. But the particular function of the important transcription factors is in determining the nature of the cells. It's becoming increasingly clear that a small group of carefully selected cells are critical for determining that, that nature, that function. So what, le what this led to was that Professor Shinya Yamanaka, working in Japan, introduced four carefully selected uh, proteins, transcription factors, into skin cells, initially of the mouse, and turned them into a special type of stem cell. They're equivalent to the pluripotent cells we can get from embryos. So because they've been made artificially, they're called induced pluripotent cells. No embryo has been involved with that group of cells there at all. These were derived from skin cells. A little later, he re repeated the same process uh, with skin cells from human donors. So what's so important about having stem cells? What, what's the critical nature of stem cells? Well, they, the, the ones we're working with, the induced pluripotent cells, have two particular characteristics which are really exciting and important. One is that they can divide many, many times. So you can start with one cell and end up with many million cells all of the same time. And whilst they do that, if you're treating them properly, they will retain the ability either to divide to produce more cells like themselves, as you see on the left, or to divide to give daughter cells that are different. And this is the, the critical function of stem cells during development. As muscle develops, for example, there will be stem cells in there that are dividing to maintain themselves but also giving rise to the daughter cells, which will form the muscle. So it's how tissue grows. In adulthood, it's how tissue is repaired, because the stem cells that are there can detect that something is wrong and can multiply in order to give rise to replacement tissue. From a research point of view, it means that we can take cells from somebody, skin cells from somebody, treat them according to Yamanaka's protocol, and have stem cells which could give rise to any type of cell which are equivalent to those 
in the person who donated the skin cell. And it's this unique combination of things which is providing new opportunities to study a particular disease, or a particular type of disease. The lady in the picture on the top left had motor neuron disease. It's a crippling disease which causes you to lose control of your limbs, your muscles, and then ultimately of your trunk. So that the person will suffer from a wasting disease which will ultimately lead to them dying because they can no longer breathe. A cruel, cruel disease. And there is no treatment for it. In fact, there's no real understanding of why it happens. Errors in a number of genes have been found to be associated with this disease, but, but why they cause this particular abnormality is not known. So the new opportunity that we and others have been seizing is to ask people like this lady to donate pieces of skin, small pieces of skin, to use the Yamanaka protocol to produce the special stem cells, and then from them to produce the type of nerves, motor neurons, hence the name of the disease, motor neurons which are affected in the disease. And we can grow these in the laboratory. And if we produce the equivalent cells from a healthy person, ideally a fairly close relative who has the same sort of genes but not the error, then we can compare, compare these in the laboratory and begin to understand precisely what's going wrong inside those cells. So this sequence gives us three things, two of which we've achieved and one we're fairly confident of achieving in the not too distant future. We can study the cause of the disease. When we understand it, we can use that knowledge to screen for drugs that would prevent the harmful effect of the abnormality. And then before long, we would hope to have a successful treatment. So let's go through that in a little bit more detail. By examining the brains of people who had died of motor neuron disease, people had found that there were abnormalities in a particular protein. Its name doesn't matter, but it tended to clump in a, a very characteristic way. And so the first thing that we wanted to know was, were these protein, was this protein normal or abnormal in the pluripotent cells that we had produced at this stage, not the motor neurons? And this is a very simple experiment. It shows a picture of a piece of jelly through which we've run proteins by using electric current. So that the electric current makes the proteins move and the smaller proteins go fastest and go further. And so they're spread. We can then use antibodies to detect the particular protein that we're interested in, because in the background there are hundreds of other proteins. But we can use antibodies to, to find the ones we're interested in. And I think you can see that there are two columns on the left-hand side where the label at the top is M337, which is the code name for the mutation, where there's an extra band about halfway up the gel, which is not present in the two other columns, which are for control samples for, taken from a healthy person. And so even in the pluripotent stem cells, we're reproducing in the lab this abnormal distribution of proteins. It's one of the mysteries of this type of illness. Why does this particular abnormal protein kill just one very specific type of nerve? Not the other nerves, not the other cells, because this protein is present in all of the cells in the body. It's completely perplexing as to why it is so precise, but it is. But we are seeing the abnormal protein uh, in the pluripotent cell. Obviously, what we then wanted to know was, could we find anything different about the nerves? And the critical test was, would they survive equally well in culture in the laboratory? And what this graph is showing is the risk of death. So the, the, the top line, the, the brownie colored line, is showing that there were more of that type of cell had died in about a week. That, that's 150 hours, is the right hand symbol on the, on the uh, x axis. So even within that very short period of time, there's a very great difference in the ability of these cells to survive in culture. So this observation, which was made at the end of last year, is really exciting because it's creating new opportunities to look for compounds which can prevent the harmful effect of that abnormality. And the kind of thing that you can imagine is using uh, screening uh, technologies, which are routine in many parts of the world, to have 
an equal number of these cells in each one of the little wells that you can see on this dish, which has 96 little wells. And to put in, into, into each well a different compound, and then to culture them for a week and see whether any of the compounds have increased the ability of the damaged cells, the, the nerves from the patient, to survive. And when, once we've done that, the law would oblige us to test the compound in animals first before we could think of moving on to giving the compound to uh, patients. But nonetheless, we're very optimistic that this will happen. There is a proof of, of concept of this approach from a group in New York who are one step ahead of this with a different, very, very rare neurodegenerative disease where they have found a compound which is able to protect the cells and are begin, beginning to test it out in patients. So, to begin to summarize, we've been able to replicate in the dish the disease which sadly killed that lady. She died three years or so ago. We're well on the way through understanding the disease and screening to look for new compounds to having a time when we would be able to give either a pill or a liquid medicine. And this is really a very convenient way to administer a treatment. It would be equally applicable not only in a rich country like our own, but in a poorer developed, uh, developing country to be able to supply a pill or, or a liquid. In the longer run, there's an additional opportunity which people are beginning to look at now, which is to, to provide cells which can support the damaged nerves. The nerves themselves are in some cases very long. I mean, they go from your brain down to your feet or from your brain out along your arm. So replacing them seems an impossible task. But all nerves are surrounded by neighbor cells which are critical for their survival. And there is evidence from experiments in animals that if you have an animal which has motor neuron disease and you put the neighbor cells into the spine, it provides some benefit. And so we can use this the same sort of approach to produce not disease cells, but healthy cells, with a view to then putting them into the spine to provide an additional benefit to, to patients with motor neuron disease. There are literally hundreds of inherited diseases. Mercifully, some of them are very, very rare. But in principle, this same approach could be used uh, to study any of, any of them, if you can produce in the dish the particular type of cell which is damaged. To study the disease, to screen for compounds, and then to offer them for treatment with the possibility of cell therapy. This is a very young audience, but even so, I imagine that most of you have elderly relatives or friends who are beginning to suffer from the degenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease, dementia, possibly motor neuron disease, MS. Diabetes is a degeneration of another organ, some forms of heart failure. If globally we coordinate our efforts, collaborate internationally, and this project which I've just mentioned involves groups in London, Edinburgh, Cambridge, New York, and San Francisco. If globally we collaborate and make a, a committed effort, if our governments, our charities, the disease-associated charities, will continue to support us. If each of us as individuals will continue to make donations, I think that this new opportunity has got the potential to transform our old age, to give us a longer period of healthy retirement. Thank you very much.